Hello, welcome back. Good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about entities that don't fit anywhere else in this course. That's why I call them unusual infectious agents. And that's why the quote is from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes, I've seen it many times. And my son does a killer riffraff. What is the minimum genome size to sustain an infection, infectious agent? Could one be infectious without any genome at all? And these questions we are going to address today. We're gonna to talk about viroids, satellites, and prions. We're gonna give us some answers. So viroids first. I love this name, right? If my license plate didn't say viruses, I would put viroids on it. But I don't really work on viroids. These are circular, single-stranded RNA entities between 120 and 475 nucleotides. They have a lot of base pairing, as you can see. So they look like a rod in the EM. They don't encode any protein. Listen to that. No protein is encoded in this. There's no protective coat. It's naked RNA, but it can still move from host to host. We know mostly about viroids of plants, but there are others, as you will see. When they're introduced into plants, they replicate. And there are two kinds of viroids. There are the pospiviroidae that replicate in the nucleus and the avsunviroidae that replicate in chloroplasts. Some of these have ribozymes. What is a ribozyme? And it's an RNA sequence that can cleave itself. It's an enzyme, probably a relic from the RNA world when there were no proteins. And so viroids have a distinction from vi viruses. Viruses are parasites of the translation machinery, right? Well, they're parasites of the host cell, but they need to get translated and make protein to get things going. Vi viroids don't, don't have any encoded protein. Rather, they are parasites of the transcription machinery of the host because that is what reproduces them. That is what copies them. And the first viroid discovered is called potato spindle tuber viroid, PSTVD. And uh, it, was, it was discovered in the production of potato seed stocks in 1967 by that gentleman, T. Theodore Otto Diener, who just died last month at the age of 102. Holy cow. Wow, that's good, right? And was, was it was good that he died? No, I mean, you can't live forever, but 102 is pretty good. I, I don't know what he was like, if he was functional, right? That's the key. He discovered these, and I always wanted to interview him. I never got a chance to, so too bad. Anyway, these, this is the prototype, and he called them viroids because they weren't viruses. They had no protein coat. And some of these don't do anything to plants, and some of them cause uh, economically important diseases of crop plants. So you can see the, the uh, tomato plant there, the healthy one, and then the one infected with viroids of different pathogenicity make it grow shorter and shorter. Uh, so you have, you have to be careful that you don't have viroids in your seed stocks. Remember, when farmers plant seeds, they usually buy the seeds from Monsanto. It's a big seed provider. And Monsanto has to make sure they're not giving the farmers seeds with viroids in them. This would be disastrous. It might put them out of business. So you have to carefully look for them. So some of my favorite viroids, okay? Kadang, Kadang, coconut viroid. Causes a lethal disease of coconut plants which makes pina colada drinkers sad. See the coconut tree there? It's all yellow because of this viroid. If you ever see one that's yellow like that, it's probably got a viroid. Hop latent viroid infects the hop plant. You know that's used to make beer, right? So beer lovers are happy that this doesn't affect them. No symptoms, so you could make beer out of this with no problem. And then the apple scar skin viroid. That's what it does to apples. Uh, they taste fine, but nobody's gonna buy this apple in the supermarket, right? Would you buy that? Because you'd look at it and go, there's something wrong with this, and you wouldn't buy it. But after you take this class, you know you could eat it because the viroid's not gonna reproduce in you. And in fact, whatever it is, is probably not gonna harm you. But um, yeah, you can't have the apple scar skin virus. So you can see they're named after 
uh, what they do in the plant. Viroid RNAs have functional regions uh, that we will talk about. These are two prototype viroids, the POSB viroidy and the Avsun viridae. So the POSB prototype is potato spindle tuber viroid and then peach latent mosaic viroid. Yep, that's what that is. Anyway, the one you can see there are regions involved in pathogenesis. There's a central conserved region. And then here, you can see the, the Avsun vira there are more extensively base paired. And then this is the ribozyme here with the boxes. That's the, the, the sequence that can cleave itself. And that's going to be useful f during the replication of these. How do these transmit? There's both vertical and horizontal transmission. Vertical means from the pollen to the plant. So here's an infected pollen. It touches the stigma. Uh, the, the, the viroid goes down into the ovary and gets into the ovule and then is transmitted to the seed and the, the seed is then infected so the next plant has it. And then horizontal is one infected plant to another. So this is, this is actually the horizontal transmission part here from the ovule to the seed, right? But that viroid got in the same way as on the right from another infected plant. Uh, and so that's how they're transmitted. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how it actually happens uh, on farms. But how do they replicate? Uh, these viroids get into cells and they are copied by host RNA polymerase II. And one group of viroids, as I told you, encodes a ribozyme. And there are different kinds of ribozymes that have cool names like hammerhead ribozyme because it looks like a hammerhead. Uh, I want to say there's a chainsaw hammerhead, but I don't think it's chainsaw. I think it's saw something, but I don't remember the name. So they're all given very uh, clever names. And so a ribozyme is an autocatalytic self-cleaving RNA. And so this was discovered in 1981. That RNA could cleave itself. And as you'll see in a moment, that cleavage activity doesn't need any protein to cleave the RNA is, is needed during replication. Not all ribozymes, not all viroids encode ribozymes. The ones that don't uh, are cleaved by nuclear enzymes. Encode is not the right word, you know, because encode means encode proteins. So how would you say not all things contain a ribozyme? I guess that would be it, yeah. Um, so are all ribozymes self-cleaving or are all viroids self-cleaving? All ribozymes are self-cleaving, but not all viroids have, have ribozymes. Okay, some of them have a dependency on host, as you'll see. So here's POSB viridae. These are the, vi the rib viroids that don't encode a ribozyme. The, the, the um, viroid is circular. It gets into the cell, it goes into the nucleus, and then Paul II of the host. DNA-dependent RNA polymerase copies this RNA to make concatamers, you know, one, two, three genomes. Uh, it goes into the nucleus, the nucleolus, where it's cleaved by, by cell enzymes, these circulize, and then they're exported, and then they can move to the next cell through those ports called plasma desmata. Now here's an example of a hammerhead ribozyme. This one goes into the chloroplast. In the chloroplast, it is copied uh, by, I think it's a DNA polymerase. Yes, chloroplast DNA polymerase, there it is. It makes concatenators. That's weird because this is RNA, right? Breaking all the rules. Yeah, rules are made to be broken, aren't they? Uh, yeah, tell the police that. Uh, that then folds into, it's cleaved uh, by its ribozyme activity, so it self-cleaves into units. It folds into uh, this, ribos this highly structured thing. And of course, this is the uh, copy of the, of the incoming. It's the opposite strand, so it has to be copied again to make the genome polarity. Uh, and move to the next cell. Well, of course, polarity is only useful to us in terms of reproduction because there's no plus and minus because there's no protein translated. Yeah, how does it get through the wall of the plant, right? That's, I think it's on one of these slides. Yeah, here it is. So basically, mechanical transmission um, by, by farm machinery, you know, tractors running over plants or even run, just moving by at equipment hands, plant to plant, so the farmers can do it when they touch it and break the plants. And also, I think insect vectors can make damage and these can get in as a consequence. So you don't need any receptors, it just goes through the cell wall. And obviously it works because these get transmitted very effectively. So these were uh, discovered, as, as I told you, in the 20th century because 
um, when people were establishing breeding lines of plants, you would take a wild plant and uh, you would establish a breeding line and the wild plant had viroids and they found them in the modern crop plants. And we think they are relics of the RNA world. So this is maybe one of the best pieces of evidence that there was an RNA world, no coding and an RNA and a ribozyme that can cleave it. It's really cool. Yeah. I'm sorry, on the last slide, you said that it gets copied into RNA by the DNA polymerase? The RNA is copied, it's reproduced by a DNA polymerase, yes. So it doesn't end up as DNA, it ends up as No, it just stays as RNA for sure, yeah. It goes from RNA to RNA to RNA. Even though DNA polymerase is involved, it's weird, yes. Then why it's colored red? <laughs> I colored it red because it's the opposite polarity of the genome and yeah, red is, is what we use for DNA. In the, so that's why you're confused probably, right? And what, I don't know what color to use. Um, I don't want to make it that olive green because that we, we reserve for, for mRNA and anti-mRNA. So we'll have to try another color, yeah. But that's just RNA, it's not, it's not DNA, right. Part of the problem is that everybody in the world uses the same seeds, it's called a monoculture. And so you, the companies that produce them, they, they put out a seed with, uh, with a ribozyme in it, with a viroid in it, this is a big problem. But also they're all homogeneous and um, monoculture and that leads to problems. So they're all, there's no variation in susceptibility. They're all equally susceptible. All right, so how do they cause disease? This is quite interesting. Vir the viroid doesn't encode any proteins, right? How is it gonna cause disease? So it turns out when the viroid gets into a plant, the plant has a, a, a siRNA machinery in it. Plants is one of the organisms where siRNAs were, developed, were discovered actually. And the viroid RNA comes in, the plant cell chops it up into 21 nucleotide RNAs as a defense mechanism because those short RNAs would then be used to defend against additional viroids. But th some of those silence host uh, mRNAs. The target of the siRNA is mRNA. And so some of the viroid uh, siRNAs silence host mRNAs and that causes the pathogenesis. So it's an accident, I, I assume, because there's no requirement for the viroid to silence uh, host RNAs, as far as I know, because if you take away those regions of the viroid, these would be the pathogenesis regions from which the siRNAs are derived, the viroid can still replicate, but it doesn't cause disease any longer. So silencing is not needed for viroid replication. And so those different phenotypes in the tomato from mild to intermediate to really massive stunting are caused by those siRNAs. For a brief time, I called these viruses. And then I got yelled at, so I stopped by Eugene Koonin, who he's pretty much an authority on the origin of uh, viruses. He said, no, Vincent, they're not viruses. They don't have a capsid. They can't be viruses. You know people that are so strident? And okay, Eugene, I'll take it out of my lecture. It was in for like two years. All right, the first question. Which of the following is not a property of viroids? Not a property. Some contain a ribozyme replicated by host RNA polymerase, metastable capsid, circular rod-like genome, none of the above. This is really easy. You have to get 100%. I would like you to because it's the end of the course and I hope you learned uh, enough to, to get this. But one of you will answer the wrong question just to be troublesome, I think. Oh, by the way, the, qu the quizzes are back, you notice? So let me say, who likes quizzes and who hates them? Do you like quizzes? Most everyone. And if you hate them, you probably won't raise your hand. Do you hate, does anyone hate them? <laughs> Richard hates them, okay? But you could be honest, I'm not gonna penalize you. So I guess it's good to interrupt and see if you're learning, okay? Maybe next year I'll write questions for, um, the rest of those. Okay, what do we have here? Uh, 90%. <laughs> okay, they don't have capsids. They don't have capsids at all. This is what Eugene Koonin said. Can't be a virus, it doesn't have a capsid. They have ribozymes, they're replicated by host RNA polymerase. 
Maybe some of you thought they're replicated by DNA polymerase, which I did say, and that makes that wrong. So maybe I should change it to some are replicated by host RNA, but the capsid is clearly wrong, so. All right, satellites. This is cool also. Satellites are viruses that depend on a helper virus to reproduce. They can't do it on their own. You, had, you saw an example of this, although we didn't call it a satellite, with Rouse, uh, not Rouse, but the, uh, the RNA tumor viruses related to Rouse that need helper viruses because the oncogenes integrate in them and disrupt essential genes. So satellites need a helper virus to co-infect the same cell. They can have single-stranded RNA, they can have DNA, they can have circular RNA genomes, right? And they, again, lack the genes needed for replication. And we have two classes of RNA satellites. We have satellite viruses because they encode structural proteins and make particles, but they do need other genes from the helper still. And then we have satellite RNAs that are packaged by helper virus proteins and also rely on the helper for replication. They have just a few of their own genes and that's not enough to, to reproduce. Some of them may not even encode protein. So some of these satellite RNAs have no protein and some of them encode one or a few proteins. So there's an example of a virus particle at the bottom where the capsid is made, is encoded in the helper virus genome. The, the helper genome is in the capsid and then the satellite genome is also in the capsid. It's very weird, isn't it? Why these things evolve, but that's nature, that's evolution. Anything that works and is competitive uh, comes up. Here, just to give you some sense of the different sizes, class one or linear RNA between 220 and 1500 bases, usually one non-structural uh, open reading frame. Class two are linear RNAs, less than 700 bases, no, no protein, and satellites are the class, uh, class three satellites are circular, three to 50, 350 to 400 bases, and they don't encode protein, just to give you a sense of the diversity. And on the right is just a schematic of how these uh, would replicate. If you have a linear satellite, they're usually circularized uh, when they come into the cell, and then they are copied by um, rolling circle replication. And this is, again, by a host, uh, could, could be uh, the, the helper, actually, it's, it is the helper um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the case of the uh, RNA helper viruses. Uh, and then they're cleaved and um, go through this cycle again. And of course, the helper virus is also in this cell uh, being reproduced on its own. Here's some examples of satellite viruses. Uh, we have, um, the virus, the helper and the satellite together are shown on the left column. So here's a DNA combination. Adenovirus or herpes viruses are helpers for adeno-associated virus. So adeno-associated virus, which is gonna play a big role in the vector lecture next time, therapeutic viruses, it's very frequently used as a vector, is a single-stranded DNA virus. Uh, and we talked about some of these, the, the weird T structures at the ends, encodes the capsid uh, of its own, but it needs other functions of adeno or herpes to reproduce. Those functions we'll talk about next time. So that's a vertebrate virus. And by the way, recently there was an outbreak of severe hepatitis in kids in the US and Scotland and Europe. Uh, a couple of papers just published on that, very interesting. And it turns out that the kids had adeno-associated virus causing their hepatitis, but they're also infected with adenovirus or herpes virus because you need both uh, to, to allow AAV to replicate. And then we have two RNA satellites. One, uh, chronic B paralysis virus is the helper and the satellite is CBPV satellite, single-stranded RNA uh, with um, 17 nanom uh, nanometer particle and um, encoding a, a capsid protein and then tobacco necrosis virus and TNV satellite. So that is a, is a bee, an animal, and a, and a plant satellite combination. So AAV is quite interesting. Um, it needs to be in, infecting a cell which is also infected with a helper, which is either adenovirus or herpes virus. So AAV has that weird uh, single-stranded DNA genome with the, with the base paired ends, which we talked about uh, a bit in terms of DNA replication. Uh, and uh, it has to have be infected with adeno and, and E1A, which you remember from in being involved in stimulating cell growth, is needed uh, for the uh, production of uh, 
the early mRNAs of the virus. Uh, all of the other functions of the virus are, are supplied on its own. A couple of other uh, functions are also needed from adenovirus, and we'll talk about those next time. Now, in plants, satellites cause very different disease symptoms from the helper alone. So when the helper infects a plant, you get one kind of pathogenesis. And if there's a helper plus a satellite, you get a distinct disease. And the kinds of disease include necrosis, which is destruction of plant cells, or chlorosis, which is no chlorophyll. Well, that's chlorosis there, where you have yellow spots on a plant. So you can be knowledgeable now. When you see a plant that's yellow, you can say, aha, a chlorotic plant, and people will be impressed. Satellites are not derived from the helper. They're a unique, distinct virus. They have no homology with the helpers whatsoever, uh, helper virus whatsoever. Now we have an interesting human virus that is a satellite virus, and that's hepatitis delta virus. And the name comes because we first discovered hepatitis and we gave them alphabetical letters, A, B, C, D, E, and there, there's the D. There's even a G. So hepatitis delta looks a little bit like a viroid and, and like a satellite. It needs a helper virus, and the helper virus is hepatitis B virus, and it is thought to, its presence is thought to increase the severity of liver disease caused by hepatitis B virus. It's a little bit controversial whether that's true or not. Some people believe it, some people don't. But I'm putting it there so you at least know that. 18 million people are at the moment infected with hepatitis delta virus. That's about 5% of the 350 million carriers of hep B. You have to have both. You can't just have delta because it won't reproduce in you. And you can see on the map there uh, the countries that have very high and intermediate and low prevalence, mostly places with a lot of hep B, but there are also other countries with hep B that don't have as much uh, delta. And its numbers are declining because if you can uh, eliminate uh, hep B infection, you will also decrease uh, hepatitis delta. This is the genome of hepatitis delta virus. The genome is at the top. It's a 1.7 KB circular RNA, highly base paired. So it kind of looks like a, a viroid, except it has a coding region. Uh, and the anti-genome shown next uh, is, encodes a ribozyme. That, dot, that red dot can cause self-cleavage of the, the RNA. And then from that RNA, from the genome, is made an, a messenger RNA, one messenger RNA which encodes uh, the delta antigen, there's a small and a large version here uh, that's, that's, as you'll see, is involved in packaging. So uh, a lot of copies of these per liver cell, as you can see here. These are what the particles look like. So on the right is hepatitis B virus, which we've seen before. It has an icosahedral capsid. Inside it is that weird, partially double-stranded DNA genome that encodes reverse transcriptase. Then the capsid has an envelope around it, and the envelope contains the viral uh, glycoprotein. Uh, and on the left is the hepatitis delta particle. So the, um, the, the glycoproteins are provided by hepatitis B virus. That's the helper function. And so it encapsidates uh, delta. Uh, and large delta is uh, protein, one of the two delta proteins, right, large and small. The large is inserted uh, into the envelope and seems to interact with the RNA genome. And then the small delta coats the delta RNA uh, inside the particle. So again, the helper functions provided by Hep B are basically making this envelope, encapsidating uh, the genome. So how does this replicate? Uh, it is copied by host cell polymerase two. And when this was discovered, it was a surprise, right? Because Paul II is, is a DNA dependent enzyme, yet this is RNA. So there's the minus strand RNA that comes into a cell, and then Paul II will start to copy it. Now you see the green is the copy, is the, the anti-genome, if you will. And these reproduce by rolling circle. Uh, the more and more copies are, are made from that genome, and then they self-cleave. The red dot is the ribozyme. So to make the unit length genomes, the ribozyme cuts itself and, and then it circularizes. And then the full length plus strand can then be copied by the same mechanism 
and make the genomes that are gonna go into virus particles. So the key here is rolling circle. You make concatomers, right? We've encountered that idea before. Uh, and then the concatomers are cleaved by the ribozyme activities, very much like uh, viroids. So that's why we have a little viroid influence uh, in this. And the other aspect of this is the, is the generation of the mRNA. The, the mRNA is made from uh, the, the processed, um, ribozyme processed genome right there. It's the same polarity as that strand. We've since discovered, so that one is a human uh, virus, right? Hepatitis Delta virus. And we thought that was it for Delta satellite viruses in humans, but it turns out they've subsequently been found in birds and snakes. And this was discovered as people were, were sequencing RNA transcripts of uh, healthy birds and six snakes, healthy birds and six snakes. So they extracted RNA from both and they sequenced the RNA and they found uh, hepatitis Delta-like viruses but no hep B, so what's the helper? Turns out that other viruses can be helpers for these Delta-like viruses, hepatitis C virus, vesicular stomatitis virus, dengue virus, West Nile virus. In cells and culture in the lab, if you infect cells with those viruses and then put snake or bird uh, Delta-like virus in them, they will get encapsidated. So which is the, the helper in snakes and birds? We don't know, but obviously it doesn't have to be hep B. And this is a phylogenetic tree of these two bird, these bird and snake hepatitis deltas compared to all the human deltas. So you can see they're quite uh, evolutionarily distant. So there are more than human um, delta-like viruses. And in fact, um, oh, this, this slide is out of sequence. I put it in the wrong place. Sorry, I'll fix it next year. Um, this is uh, another study that just came out where they, they mined all the transcriptomes that have been done. A metatranscriptome is, let's say you take dirt and you extract RNA, you sequence it all. So whatever is in there, you're gonna get sequences. So they, they did, you can, you can get access to all those metatranscriptomes uh, and uh, you can look for viroid-like sequences. And so they find many throughout the world, as you can see in the map, all those dots are places where the metatranscriptome contains um, virus like close circular, covalently close circular RNAs. And where do they find them? In soil, plant litter, peat, the plant rhizosphere, everything associated with a plant, including the microbes and the rabbits and the, whatever insects are on it, that's the rhizosphere. The plant phylosphere, the, it's in the oceans, fresh water. Uh, I don't know what engineered is. I have no idea what that is. Uh, in other waters and animal microbiome. So there are lots of viroid-like uh, closed circular RNAs in the world other than the plant viroid. So that's the point I want to make that they're not just in plants any longer. So this, this study, which was just published, um, shows that they're, they're far more widespread. And one of the authors on this study is Eugene Koonin, who I imitated earlier. He's quite a character. I have two interviews with him. Yeah, it's very, very much worth listening to. All right, next question. Which of the following statements about satellites is correct? There are no human satellites. They are defective viruses derived from the helper. Like viroids, they do not encode protein. In plants, they cause symptoms distinct from helper virus. All of the above are correct. All right, what do we have here? Yeah, in plants, they cause symptoms distinct from helper. That's, uh, not, that's not right. That is right, I'm sorry, yes, it is correct. <laughs> Fooling myself with all these double negatives. They, they do cause uh, symptoms distinct from the helper. There are human satellites, Delta is one. Their defective viruses derived from the helper uh, is not correct. Like viroids that do not encode protein, Hep Delta, for example, encodes proteins. Uh, and so that's why we got that. Okay, virophages, here's another one. What is a virophage? So, Phagin is the Greek is from the Greek to eat. So the bacteriophage, the viruses of bacteria were originally named because they killed bacteria, and so they said, ah, it looks like they're eating them. Virus eater. So this would be a, a an eater of viruses, virophages. 
They are circular, double-stranded DNA viruses with an icosahedral shell. And they, again, they will only replicate in cells infected with a helper virus. And typically, uh, it is a giant virus, the helper virus. Now, these have been widely covered in the press. I don't know why, because the other helper-dependent viruses are never covered in the press. I don't know why these were. Maybe, I think people are fascinated with these giant viruses. And so these have a giant virus as a helper. But the, pre, the, the article always says these virophages replicate inside giant viruses. No, they do not. They replicate inside cells infected with a giant virus. So that's why I say not within another virus. You can't, no, nothing replicates within a virus particle because the, well, all the things you need are not there, right? So you will now know this because you took this course, right? <laughs> I don't mean to single you out, but now you will know not to write uh, these, these virophages reproduce within other viruses or within other virus-infected cells. And these interfere with uh, replication of the helper. They're all over the place. Uh, if you just take, um, so you, we have DNA from all over the world, from the oceans, from, from dirt, uh, I'm going to talk, well, we don't do ecology this year, but many years ago, uh, uh, well, sometime a boat went around the world sampling water at different depths, uh, and they sequenced the water all across the oceans at different depths, and you can access those sequences, and you can mine them for what look like virophages. So these are just, the map shows you all the places where you can see uh, virophage DNA, and the table shows the first one was a uh, virophage called Sputnik, which was a virophage that depended on Mimi virus to be in infected. It was isolated from a cooling tower in Paris, France. So whenever I look out at the New York cooling tower, I think of virophages. Remember, they have to also have amoeba in those cooling towers. And so that's where the virus, the giant virus would replicate in, and also the, um, the, the virophage. You know what else grows in those uh, cooling towers? It grows in the amoeba, sometimes causes respiratory illness in people. Anybody know? It's not a bacteria course, I know. I'm just seeing uh, the extent of your knowledge. Legionella. Legionella causes pneumonia. Do you know why it's called Legionella? Legionnaires. <laughs> because it, it, the first outbreak was at a Legionnaires convention in Philadelphia. So they called it Legionella. But they live in the uh, amoeba in the water towers and Sometimes those are used for cooling and they aerosolize and that's, that's where you get it from. So this was also in an amoeba in a cooling tower. Then we have Texas Coastal Waters, Organic Lake, which is in Antarctica. One was isolated from the contact lens fluid of a patient with keratitis. They called it lentille virus, right? That means lens in French. The French are just wonderful at naming viruses. Mimi virus, right? That's French. Mama, Mumu. <laughs> I was at a meeting where someone sang a song based on Bohemian Rhapsody. Mama, you know that song, right? Oh, it was so good. It was so good. Um, and so these uh, viruses depend on the helper. But we also think they can shuffle genomes around from virus to virus and host to host. But here's what they look like. They uh, are icosahedrally encapsidated, as you can see here. They're, they're bona fide viruses. And look what they do. Uh, to Mimi virus. So here, here on the upper left is a cell infected with both Mimi virus and Sputnik. So Mimi virus is the helper and Sputnik is the, um, the virophage. And these little particles there are Sputnik. They're much smaller than uh, Mimi virus. So look what it does to Sputnik. So here is a defective Sputnik where the, 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 the fuzzy particle, the, the fuzzy strands on the outside of the particle are all disrupted. You can see here, you can see this one is all broken. It's got multiple layers here that's defective. And sometimes the, the Sputnik is within, the, it gets encapsidated within uh, the helper virus, as you can see there. So it really depresses the yield of uh, helper virus RNA. Now, at the same meeting where the guy sang Mama, Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, he was offended that these are called satellites. <laughs> he said they should be called viruses because they have a big genome and they encode a capsid, which is beautiful. He said, why do we call them 
satellites because think of this, this was his logic. Autonomous virus, what's an autonomous virus? A virus that reproduces on its own, like herpes virus or adenovirus. They depend on a host cell, right? They, the, the host cell is the helper for them. So uh, regular viruses depend on the transcriptional machinery of a host cell, and uh, virophages depend on the transcriptional machinery of another virus. So why should we give it a special name? Satellite. So he says they should just be called viruses or virophages. I think it's a good argument. Last subject is the one which will make you not eat beef again. I used to have an H5N1 lecture in this course, and this one, and students would say, I don't eat chicken and beef anymore after that lecture. He would say, thank you, professor, for eliminating two of my favorite uh, meals. So prions, prions, infectious proteins, no nucleic acid. A prion can infect you and cause disease. And um, these are very popular news items because they're so weird. Um, BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad, mad cow disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakobs, grape, Ikuru, chronic wasting disease of air, deer is the latest one we'll talk about. Discovered by Stan Prusiner, who got the 1997 Nobel Prize in Medicine for this. I remember he gave a lecture at Columbia at the medical school one year, the same day they announced his Nobel Prize. Wasn't that cool? And there's a place called with a prion road. I don't know where this is, but I like that it's no through road. Yeah, that's true. Now, if you are into ballet, and uh, sometimes I do have ballet dancers in this class. And in fact, one year she went to medical school. She said, I can't dance forever, so I want to go to medical school. Uh, this is, uh, you know, George Balanchine. He used to be the director of the New York City Ballet. And he died. He, he died one year. And this is an interesting article by uh, Lawrence Altman, who's a pretty good science writer. He died last year at 79, mystery of his death. You know, he, he went through a period where he couldn't move or dance or think, and nobody knew what was wrong with him, but when they took out samples of his brain, they, they said he suffered from one of the most, world's most unusual diseases, Creutzfeldt-Jakob. It is characterized in the group of so-called slow virus diseases. No, it's not a virus. This is what they used to call it before they knew it was a prion. So Larry, you should, you shouldn't have, this is 1984, not good. Extremely long incubation period. So George Balanchine had a, uh, had a prion disease, in case you're interested. So uh, prion diseases are also called transmissible, spongy form encephalopathies. Encephalopathy is disease of the brain, and um, these are typically fatal neurodegenerative disorders of mammals. We don't know it in uh, any other uh, species. And we get thousands of cases a year of, of humans being diagnosed uh, with these. About 1% are by infection, and the others are sporadic, as you will see. And there was an outbreak of a slightly different form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob in, uh, in the 2000, late 90s, 2000, from uh, people eating contaminated meat uh, cows, basically, with bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And you can't know if a cow has this. So every time you eat a burger, and you know what? You can make it as well done as you want. It ain't going to inactivate the prion. So take your risk. It's very, it's very rare, but you know, it depends how paranoid you are. What heat does it take to denature? Autoclaving, formaldehyde, bleach, nothing inactivates it. It must be from outer space, right? No, just kidding. Now, all these things do not inactivate it. Well, yeah, <laughs> fire would probably burn it, yes, but it's not a proper disinfection method, I think, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's an example of, a, I'm gonna bring, come to it, but a guy had this and he was demented. He came into an emergency room and shot himself and his brains went all over the equipment and had to throw it all out because you can't decontaminate it. So you can't, they, all this expensive equipment that's in ERs got splattered with his brains. And every ER in the, in the world should have a protocol for dealing with someone who comes in and puts his brains over everything. You gotta throw everything out because you can't sterilize it, yeah. It's a real problem. Uh, so don't eat beef. 
and maybe even deer. So the ones in animals, bad cow is, a, is, a, is beef, bovine spon bon spongiform encephalopathy. Question? Do you eat beef? No. No, I don't eat beef or chicken or any meat, actually, because I don't like the way the animals are killed. It's kind of heartless, right? I, I don't think this is much of a risk, so I would eat beef if you like it. It's fine, yeah. I eat the fake beef. I think that's really good. My, my, I know the guy at Stanford who started that, that company, and he's working on chicken and fake chicken and fake veal. Uh, so there's chronic wasting disease, which is deer, elk, and moose. And then there's some uh, exotic ungulate. These are Nyala and greater kudu animals that are in, in Africa mainly. Feline, so there's domestic cat. Your cat can get a, a TSE, and so can the big cats, the tigers and lions. Sheep and goats get a disease called scrapie, and then mink get it as well. So many animals get this. Um, and humans, we have a, a bunch of them. They're called Kreutzfeldt Jakob. That's what Balanchine had. We have fatal familial insomnia, gershman straussler syndrome, Kuru, and variant CJ. These all have slightly different incubation periods and pathologies, but are all prion diseases. They're transmissible spongiform uh, encephalopathy. So spongiform, this is how your brain is after you get a prion disease. You have holes in it, all right? And that's not normal. You shouldn't have holes in your brain and this causes psychomotor dysfunction, it causes cognitive dysfunction. Many people, you know, they can't move. Remember, Balanchine couldn't move, he couldn't think. Many of them just sit and stare and don't say anything after extensive brain damage. And each of those diseases that I showed you has a slightly different pathology and its symptomatology as well. So where did this start? It began with sheep. Uh, Scrapie is the name of the, the prion disease in sheep. It was the first TSE recognized. It's called scrapie because the sheep uh, rub themselves on fences and they rub off their, um, what is it, fur? Do sheep have fur or hair? Wool. Wool. Okay, wool. I don't want to get another email from someone saying he said something wrong. So in the fields, they rub themselves on the fences. They also have motor disturbances. They have trembling. In um, Canada, this is called tremblant du mouton, trembling sheep, paralysis, weight loss, and very quick death, typically. This has been recognized in, in sheep for over 250 years, and it's still a, a disease of sheep. Um, in the UK, about 1% of sheep uh, develop uh, this disease every year. There's nothing you can do about it, as you will see, because it involves a misfolding of your own protein. So the reason we've discovered prions, farmers noticed that this disease could be transmitted. So if they brought a sheep to their buddy down the road, sometimes it transmitted this disease. So you know, farmers are astute. They can make these, these observations because their livelihood depends on it. And so um, people started to do experiments to try and figure out what was going on. In 1939, well, people said, is this a virus? So what do you do if you think it's a virus? You grind up the brain and you pass it through a filter, right, that would pass only viruses, filterable viruses, and they found it went through the filter. So you take the filtrate and you would inject it into another animal, and they found that they, they, they passed the filter and they thought it was viruses for many years. But it was extremely resistant to UV, not fire, but UV, ionizing radiation, formaldehyde, things that viruses are not resistant to because the UV and ionizing radiation, of course, uh, damages the genome. There's no genome here. And so the idea became that they don't have nucleic acid in them. And uh, if you're interested in this story, Stan Prusner wrote an autobiography, which is really good, where you know he says at meetings he was ridiculed for years he says, Stanley, you're just, you're missing the virus that's present. You don't know what you're doing. You need to go back. Can you imagine? And he turned out to be right. And it's always often that case in science that the outliers make uh, the discoveries. Here's one of the experiments that showed uh, this is not a virus. So this is a uh, inactivation curve. You're irradiating uh, various viruses and the scrapie agent here. So this is dose in rads. And then you, you irradiate the virus and then you measure its infectivity. So we have a molecular weight of the genome here on the left, um, KB of the genome, and then the dose in rats. And you can see 
Uh, the bigger genomes need less irradiation because they're a big target. It's really easy to hit them, right? So you need less irradiation. And as the genome gets smaller and smaller, you need more and more radiation. And the, the Scrapie agent was all the way here, separate from most viruses, except circle viruses seem to be highly resistant as well, but those, of course, are viruses. They have nucleic acid. So this is the first piece of evidence that suggests that there's no uh, nucleic acid in these. The other that uh, pushed the field forward is that it turned out that people, people started to study the animal TSEs like Scrapie and the human Scrapie, uh, the human uh, TSEs, and they had similar properties. Uh, deep plasma membrane defects, vacuolization, as I showed you, of the gray matter, spongiform appearance, and, and other. There are also accumulation of uh, glial fibrillary acidic protein in clumps in the brain, amyloidosis, which is also uh, characteristic of um, other uh, degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So the idea was that we can use animal models uh, to study this disease. What was done then is to take a sheep that died of scrapie, you grind up the brain, and you can inject the brain into other species. Now sheep is not very convenient to do these experiments, and so people found you could put these, these extracts into the brain of mice or hamsters, and they would develop uh, the disease. Uh, but the problem was the incubation period is a long time. Cerebellar ataxia, dementia, death occurs after many months or many years. So it was necessary to find animal models where this was occurring faster, and Stanley Prusner was uh, one of the people who did that. So uh, the way these, these diseases work is the prions, the misfolded prions, uh, accumulate in peripheral organs and then spread to the CNS, and then the pathology develops, uh, including the, the features I've showed you, spongiform loss of neurons. Um, the interesting thing is there's no inflammatory response. So in a typical viral disease, right, you would get inflammation, no, no, no inflammatory response, no antibodies are produced, there's no cellular immune response because it's a self-protein. It's your own protein that is causing uh, this disease. And so these are a problem because you cannot detect them until you show those first symptoms. You have trouble walking, Balanchine used to wear these jackets with, uh, with leather on the arms, you know those? He, he started bumping into the walls in his, uh, in his office and people noticed the, the color from his elbow was rubbing on the walls. That's the first thing, well, why is he bumping into the walls? And because he was starting to lose his ability to walk. By then it's too late. There is nothing you can do. There's no treatment. We still have no treatment today. Uh, and they're all fatal. If, if you develop a TSE, you 100% you're gonna die. And I don't know if we're ever gonna be able to fix that. So what are these in 1967? Actually, a mathematician named Griffin said that they're a protein. And in 1981, Prusiner identified protein complexes in scrapey brain, so sheep who had this disease. He purified the protein and showed you could transmit the disease to animals. And this is when they said, Stanley, you're missing the virus that's present in your, in your protein prep preparations. Um, but he eventually, uh, so he called it a prion, proteinaceous and infectious particles. He had some other name. Yeah, so pro, proteinaceous and infectious particle is proin, right? And in his book, he said he was in the hospital uh, cafeteria, he's eating a tuna fish sandwich. You know, when people write, they have to tell you all these details. Tuna fish sandwich. And he, he's writing down names for this protein. He said, no, proin is not going to cut it. So he, ch changed the, he changed the letters around to prion. You have to admit, prion is a cool word. It's like viroid. Two really good words. And um, he then cloned the gene encoding this protein. And in mice, if you knock it out, they don't develop prion disease. So he proved it was a cellular gene, no, no virus uh, involved. So th what's, what's going on here is that the pathogenic protein, the prion, which is the name for the pathogenic protein, is a conformational isoform of a normal cell protein, which is called PRPC. So PRPC means cellular, prion protein cellular. This protein is mostly on neurons. It's anchored by a GPI anchor, and it becomes conformationally altered in the disease state, and in that state it's called PRPSC or scrapie in honor of the sheep. 
but obviously there are other species that have PRP SCs in them. Uh, and so you take PRP SC from a sheep brain, if you put it into another animal, it will cause the PRPC from that animal to fold, misfold and become PRPSC. And that's the pathogenic conformation that multiplies. Eventually, all of your PRPC is converted to PRPSC, and that causes the pathology. So here is a, a schematic of that. Uh, Prusiner actually found early on that if you took the PRPC protein, so that's a schematic of it, and digested with proteinase K it would be completely digested. So proteinase K is an enzyme that chops up protein. If you take the SC form and digest it with proteinase K, it doesn't chop it all up. It just cuts a little bit off the end terminus and you have what's left at 27 to 30 kilodalton uh, protein that's resistant to proteinase K. And so it's a marker for PRPSC. So in the early days, you could um, you could raise antibodies in, in different species against this protein. You could do Western blots to see, yeah, there's a lot of PRP2730 in the brain. And so the PRPC protein you can see here, lots of beta of alpha helix, a little beta strands here, but, but the PRPSC has a, a ton of beta strands, a different conformation, uh, and that makes it resistant to proteinase K. So the disease protein has a different conformational state. And so the, some of the early experiments that were done, so if you take out the PRNP gene in mice, they're resistant to infection. You, you put PRPSC in them, they will not develop prion disease because there's no PRPC in them to misfold. You can introduce PRPSC into animals. You can eat beef that's contaminated, you will get infected. That's what we call infection. But more frequently, we have mutations in the PRNP gene that lead, that encourage formation of the altered conformation. Uh, and as I said, that leads to accumulation of PRPSC uh, leading to the symptoms. So most of the time you don't have to eat anything, you actually get it by misfolding. So let me summarize for it. There are three kinds of spongiform encephalopathies. We have the infectious or transmissible, let's say, where you eat something. It doesn't have to be just eating. Um, before we knew about these, we spread it by blood transfusion. We spread it by, by corneal. So people used to get corneal transplants and you got it from that. We used to make hormones from people before we did recombinant DNA and could make it in other cells. So people who got purified human hormones would get these diseases from that before we knew that these were a thing. So it doesn't have to be eaten. But anyway, what happens is in those cases where it's a, a transmissible, the misfolded prion is introduced to you and it causes your PRPC to misfold and you make a ton of PRPSC in the brain and that causes the disease. Then we have familial encephalopathy, which is basically a genetic disease where you inherit from your parents a mutation in the PRNP gene, and that predisposes the PRPC to misfold spontaneously. And we know what those changes are, so you can get your genome sequenced and know if you have a risk factor for developing a TSC. So that would be familial. And then we have sporadic, where there's no mutation in the PRNP gene, it just spontaneously misfolds. We have no idea what the risk factors are. And you one day develop the TSE and you haven't eaten anything, you haven't gotten any transplants, you have no risk factors. It's just a misfolding. So there must be a certain rate of misfolding of the protein. So no matter how the TSE arises, you can take the brain of the animal and put it into another animal or feed it and you will transmit the disease. So once you have PRPSC, you can transmit it by giving it to uh, another animal, either by injection or by, by them eating it. All right, so human TSEs um, include, and I wanna talk a little bit about each of these. These are the infectious or transmissible ones. Kuru, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, then we have had spread uh, of TSEs by transplantation of corneas, hormones, blood from patients with CJ, right? We didn't have a, we didn't know they had it. It was before they develop symptoms. They have a lot of PRPSC in them. We have no t test for it. So uh, these are transmitted that way. And then the BSE 
uh, outbreak feeding. So BSE was a disease of cattle, which arose because we fed cows meat from animals who died of TSEs. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we, the humans ate that cow meat and they got another TSE called variant CJD because it's different from CJD. And that risk factor was eating uh, BSC beef. Okay, so here, the Kuru is a fatal TSE found in the four people of New Guinea. That's New Guinea there. It has a 30 year incubation period. And Carlton Gaijusek, an American virologist, went there and studied it. He brought Prusner with him as well on some of his trips. Turns out only, men and, only women and children get the disease because when someone dies in this, um, uh, in the four people, the ritual is for the women and children to eat the brains of the people who die. So if they died of a spontaneous TSE, that would be passed on to them because you can get it from eating. So Gaijusek picked this up. He told them to stop eating the brains. They did, and now there's no more Kuru. But this was one of the first uh, examples of a human TSE. It didn't matter if they cooked it or not, would not inactivate infectivity. Uh, then we have sporadic. So that, that's an example of a transmissible. Then we have sporadic where about one in two per million humans worldwide every year, typically 50 to 70 years of age. Uh, that, that accounts for 65% of all the TSEs we see. They just get a disease. They have normal PRNP genes and they can transmit it to others if they give blood or corneas or growth hormone, whatever. Uh, and um, so that's a sporadic where no genetic um, risk factor is involved. And we think Kuru may have started in New Guinea with someone many years ago who developed sporadic uh, TSE, which is sporadic Kuru, and that person died and they ate the brains and then they started to spread it to other individuals. So you just have one uh, sporadic case and then it goes on. Uh, then we have the familial which is an inherited disease, as I say, is a, is a single autosomal dominant mutation in the PRNP gene. And again, if you develop this and you give corneas, if you give blood products, et cetera, it can be infectious. So in all cases, the PRPSC is infectious. It can transmit the disease to others. So here's a graph of the deaths in the US from Creutzfeldt-Jakob, uh, which is a sporadic, the sporadic form of, of this disease by year 1979 through 2020. So the blue is the number of deaths and the red is the age adjusted uh, death rate. So the death um, is per million persons. So, uh, so the, the, the number of deaths, it's 500 or so there uh, they, they in, in 2020. In uh, the red is about, you see one in 1.5 per million. So one to 1.5 per million deaths from Kreisfeld Jacob in the US. So it's a rare disease, but not, not zero, obviously. And as I said before, the way we think you would acquire it by ingesting, say, contaminated meat, you would, you would eat it, it would go into your intestine. The PRPSC that you've ingested would convert PRPC on your epithelium to PRPSC. And then we have the dotted red line here where it goes into the neuron. We don't know exactly how that happens, but obviously the gut is innervated, so uh, there are nerve endings that could take up the PRPSC and bring it to the CNS. So that would be infection. Then of course, genetic and sporadic, where just the protein is misfolding in your brain and that causes a lot of PRPSC to turn over into PRPSC. Now BSC, interestingly, was because we were making cannibals out of cows. Uh, cows, you know, normally would eat grass in the pasture, but if you want them to grow quickly, you feed them meat. And so cows are fed typically other animals that are ground up, including sheep with scrapie. So it's a form of cannibalism. And um, so we give cows meat, meat and bone meal feed, which is made from uh, other animals. In the 1970s, they changed the procedure for making this. They wanted to save money. I think they eliminated a heating part and that allowed the scrapey prions from sheep to get into cows. So they'd been feeding cows sheep for years, but they changed the procedure. And now the cows developed a, a, a TSE 
and we had this outbreak of what they called mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And then people ate the meat from those cows and they developed TSE, which was called variant CJ because it had different characteristics compared with regular CJ. So this is uh, the epidemic curve of BSC in cattle. You can see uh, starting in 1988, this is, um, Cases in cows, there were thousands of cases in cows, cases per thousand, sorry, going up to 35, 45, 40 cases per thousand. Then it goes down when we realize um, we shouldn't be giving them, the, we go back to the old method of making the feed and it goes down, but um, one to two million cattle end up getting infection. The problem is that the incubation time is five years and typically you slaughter cows for meat when they're younger. So you don't know they're infected. That's why it got into the food chain. It's still a problem today because you can have cows developing sporadic TSEs, right? The, from the sporadic ones where you just have misfolding, that could be introduced into the food chain and you wouldn't know it. So still an issue. Uh, then we have the overlapping epi curve of uh, humans getting BSE or Kreutzfeld Jakob from eating meat, and that uh, declines by 2007. And some of these individuals gave blood and they passed it on to others who got blood from them before we knew they were infected. So if you lived in the UK during this period, um, you can't give blood for the rest of your life because you may have prions in you, yeah. Proteins misfold all the time, at least as I understand. Do we know why PRPC misfolding causes every other PRPC to misfold, where in other contexts it'll just happen once and then the rest of your proteins will be No, gone? it's a unique, it's a unique property though of, there are other prions in other organisms, but they're not pathogenic when they misfold. So there are prions in yeast, for example, that fold differently and they have a different function, but they're not pathogenic. This is the only one where it's pathogenic, but we don't know why that happens, yeah. So we still get cases of BSE in cow, they're sporadic, they happen in the US and Canada, and we don't test cows for TSEs. We do have some tests now, but we don't test them. In Japan though, they test every cow for TSE. Every single cow is tested. Of course, if you buy beef in Japan, it's very expensive, and that's part of it. But we have diagnostic tests, um, we have no drugs to prevent this. So these are BSE cases in uh, North America, in cows, by country, year and country. So Canada and the US, you can see there are a couple of cases where a cow is picked up that has a, BS, a TSE. Um, and so there's concern that this could get into the food supply because we don't check all cows. And this is the uh, article, uh, prion contamination in the emergency room that I told you about. The other one is a case where a guy living in, I think, Saudi Arabia or somewhere in the Middle East, uh, developed a TSE and died. And it turned out he had lived in the UK in the period where this BSE outbreak was happening and he had eaten hamburgers. So that was his risk factor. And I did an interview with Richard Knight who studies uh, TSEs in the UK. And it's really informative if you want to learn more. He knows a lot about these things. All right, so three epidemics, right? The top one is in humans. We give growth hormones to uh, people f uh, made from humans that are contaminated. We have an outbreak of TSEs caused by that. On the bottom is a kind of graft, Duramata graft. It also was contaminated. And in the bottom, uh, prion contaminated meat from cows, uh, which led to variant uh, Kreutzfeld Jakob. So three different outbreaks by, uh, by transferring things to people that we didn't know were there. Now there is a species barriers of prions, the most effective infection is when you put the prion into the same species. A different species is often not working. So if the sequences are the same, that's the best. And here are two examples. If you take a hamster PRPSC, you put it into a mouse, there's no disease. But if you make the mouse transgenic for hamster PRNP gene, then the hamster PRPSC will make disease because the protein matches, right? Bovine cow PRPSC has a broad host range. So you can take cow PRPSC and put it into mice and it will cause disease. Obviously we did that experiment in humans. You put cow PRPSC into humans, we get disease. That's why BSC is a concern because it has a broad host range. I'm gonna skip this because we don't have enough time to get through the rest, sorry. Now the latest is deer, elk, and moose seem to be developing TSEs at high rates. It's been detected all over the US and Canada. Many 
high percentages of animals are positive uh, in, in, in the wild. So they're, they're standing herds where they're captive, high positivity, but also wild cervids. And that's what the deer look like. Uh, you know, they have problems moving and they have uh, fur reminiscent of scraping. And so this is the epi curve. You can see it was total deer uh, captive and free ranging on that graph. You can see the numbers are increasing kind of alarmingly. And this is a map uh, of cases that have been detected uh, in the US. This is again in deer and elk and in moose. And an experiment was done uh, in the laboratory some time ago showing that if you grow a plant in the laboratory and you put prions in the dirt, the prions get taken up into the root, they make their way out into the leaves, and you, if you feed the leaves to mice, you can give them TSEs. So deer excrete these TSEs, so the possibility is that plants will take them up, and if there are cows around, so deer will go into a cow pasture at night and sh shed their prions, and we're worried that the cows will, will get infected. So here's some experiments to look at the host range. Cervid, PRPS, so you put it into mice, no disease, species barrier. If you put it into mice transgenic for cervid, PRNP, you get disease. So this is good. It looks like the cervid doesn't have a, low, a broad host range. Um, if you put the cervid PRPSC into mice that are transgenic for human PRNP, no disease. So that's good, right? However, we don't know if, it's, if, the, if the prion is passed through other species, you'll get disease or not. So it's, it's been shown that deer prions will infect raccoons. Is that a groundhog in the middle there? A cow? If you put it right in the brain, they get disease. So... We're, we're wondering if these deer prions could transmit to other animals and then you pass it along, maybe it would modify uh, the host range. But so far, uh, none of these have been shown to be infected in pastures. Uh, nevertheless, hunters are told if you hunt deer, you have to do certain things. There's a website for you, cwd.info-info.org. Uh, if the animal's weird, don't shoot it and eat it, wear gloves. Uh, don't saw through the bone, get it, stay away from the brain or spinal cord, don't touch those tissues, don't touch the eyes, spinal cord, spleen, tonsils, lymph nodes, where we know the prions um, uh, accumulate, and certainly don't eat uh, meat from a positive animal. Uh, many people hunt deer in the U.S., as you know, so we're a little concerned. So this is a summary of how we think many of these TSEs arose. So. The blue is naturally occurring disease. So scrapie, we think, naturally arose in sheep as a sporadic disease in sheep. And maybe uh, the, the deer and elk disease is a sporadic disease as well. Or maybe they acquired it from sheep. We don't really know. Uh, feeding sheep to mink gave rise to transmissible mink encephalopathy. And of course, the sheep going into cows eventually made their way into humans. Uh, and then there, in 1920 in blue, humans probably developed sporadic disease on their own without any infection. And so uh, that's an independent one. And then from the cows, we have infected other animals uh, as well. So it's an interesting disease. It's rare, but curious, and remains to be seen what's going to happen with uh, the deer uh, diseases. All right, so next time, our last lecture, we will talk about making viruses work for us, therapeutic viruses. <laughs>